Well, it's finally the end of 2015, and what a year. In honor of this rotation around the spherical ball of plasma in the center of our solar system, I'd like to make a video recapping all the notable paleontological discoveries of this year. And I plan to make this an annual thing for every year from here on out. And after listing all the discoveries I can, I will give you guys my New Year's predictions and wish list for the discoveries that will be made in next year in paleontology. And also what videos I plan to do in 2016, so stay tuned for this special annual end of the year video. What we dug up. We've discovered a lot this year. I mean a lot. This year has been one of the most successful for gathering knowledge about prehistory for a few years because of the sheer amount of discoveries made. This year is basically the year of the dinosaurs because we have discovered so, so, so many newly discovered dinosaur species of varying unique traits and changes onto previously identified species. So to start off, we have gathered a rather massive dragon in China this year. Kitzeng Long was yet another towering sauropod dinosaur. Kitzeng Long's head and a few neck vertebrae were discovered in southern China and is named after the nearby city Kitzeng, with its name translating to the dragon of Kitzeng. Kitsane Long lived in late Jurassic China about 60 million years ago and calculated to be about 15 meters long or 50 feet long. This dinosaur was massive but by all means was not the largest sauropod. With other sauropods like Diplodocus, 82 feet or 25 meters long, dwarfing Kitsane Long in length. Kitsane Long is not really anything too interesting or unique considering we've already found larger and stranger sauropods in past years. Moving on to Brontosaurus, a rather famous sauropod, was reinstated as an independent species. For over a century, it was believed that Brontosaurus, originally described by Charles Marsh in 1879, was simply an Apatosaurus that was misidentified as a separate species, creating the popular saying, Brontosaurus never existed. Well now, in 2015, scientists concluded that Brontosaurus did exist, and there were enough differences to count it as its own species, destroying the 112-year-old saying, Brontosaurus does exist, people. Studies at the University of Bristol may have discovered that Stegosaurus had some form of sexual dimorphism, that is a notable physical difference between male and female, on the back plates of the dinosaurs. With one sex featuring tall, pointed plates, and the other having wider, rounded plates. Males would have round back plates, and females would have tall, pointed plates. This might have aided in sexual display, and back plates might have been covered in bright colors to attract the opposite sex, while also making it easy to tell the gender of your neighbors easily. There is a few criticisms of this idea, mostly due to the relatively small sample size and the difficulty of matching jumbled plates and the specific skeletons, and by all means none of this is conclusive. But it is still a neat thing to think about, and it's something we see in a lot of modern day dinosaurs. So male and female stegosaurs might have looked very different from each other. Two new and equally interesting ceratopsids were discovered this year as well, Windy Ceratops in southern Alberta, Canada, and Regal Ceratops, or Hellboy, in Canada. Regal Ceratops was named after its plate frill which its describers thought looked a lot like a crown, and was given the name Hellboy after the fictional character, possessing similar looking horns, while Windy Ceratops was named after its discoverer, a Canadian fossil hunter named Windy. Both lived near the end of the Mesozoic, and both roamed lands also inhabited by Tyrannosaurus. It should be noted that Regal Ceratops was closely related to Triceratops than Windy Ceratops, which was closely related to Pachyrhinosaurus and Centrosaurus. Both Ceratopsids had a very beautiful and elaborate headgear. We also discovered Jan Yuenlong, a beautifully preserved dromaeosaur from Laoning, China. It was close in size and relatively closely related to Velociraptor and Dionychus, and its discovery clearly displayed that all dromaeosaurs, even large ones, had basically a full covering of feathers, wings, and a tail fan, something we already knew for a long time. The strangest thing is that most news sources mistakenly believe that this was the first evidence of its kind. Well, anyways, Zatanna Yulong shut up all those pesky fanboys that still believed that Velociraptor was a featherless lizard, even after many evidences such as quill knobs disproved this long ago. Zatanna Yulong, surprisingly, was not the only new species of dromaeosaur discovered this year, and definitely not the only feathered dinosaur discovered too. Eugruna Alec, another duck-billed hadrosaur, was discovered in the Prince Creek Formation and lived in a location that was above the Paleoarctic Circle, meaning it lived in a rather frigid and cold environment. Eugruna Alec is yet another example of a polar dinosaur, along with Nanoxaurus, a polar tyrannosaur, Mudabuttersaurus, another hadrosaur, Lee Elnosaurus, Krylophosaurus, and many other polar dinosaurs. The still yet to be properly named Lightning Claw Dinosaur was discovered in Australia this year, and is the largest theropod dinosaur discovered in Australia, only one of two in the whole continent, and is only known from a few fragmented remains. It was a massive 20 foot long megaraptor, no doubt a predator. Hualian Ceratops was a new ceratopsid also discovered in northwestern China, and was a relative of the famous Cetacosaurus. 
Morelodon, a new humpback dinosaur, was discovered recently, having a similarly elongated vertebra to the also humpback Oranosaurus. Cunbarosaurus was again another very recent discovery and is also to date the best preserved ankylosaur fossil in the world, and the most complete dinosaur so far discovered in Australia. Cunbarosaurus was a relative of ankylosaurus, and exquisitely preserved its scales and armor that it bore in life in its fossil. Lawa avis was a new terra bird discovered this year as well. It was smaller than some of the most previously discovered one, Lawa avis was around 4 feet tall, and was yet again another flightless carnivorous bird from South America during the Pliocene in Argentina. Nevertheless, Lawa avis seems like it would have been a great pet. Extensive studies on the Jane subadult T. rex specimen have shown that Nano Tyrannus most likely was a juvenile T. rex. Oh, Colinda Dromaeus had its first birthday this year after its discovery in 2014. The scientific community in general, for some reason, hasn't noticed the sheer importance of Colinda Dromaeus, and it still isn't celebrated as much as it should be. The dinosaur alone proved that all dinosaurs share a common feathered ancestor, and it should be recognized as such. I don't know, this little dinosaur is very important, and is one of the most important paleontological discoveries of the decade, and is up there with Dinonychus. Well, anyways, happy birthday, Colinda Dromaeus. We also discovered extensive skin impressions from the rather famous Ornithomimus, a distant relative to Tyrannosaurus and Raptors. Ornithomimus lived in North America during the late Cretaceous, and its name means ostrich mimic, and the new skin impressions show that the skin coverings were actually very, very similar to a modern ostrich. The impressions of Ornithomimus were discovered in Canada, and is one of the few fossils of non-avian dinosaurs to preserve feathers in North America. But maybe another North American theropod will come up soon with preservation of feathers. Filament-like dino fuzz covered the majority of the body with simple, wispy feathers running along the neck, chest, back, and tail. The arms bore wings with pinaceous feathers, probably used during mating displays. But the legs were different. They were naked, devoid of scales or feathers. In the 2015 specimen, Ornithomimus had bare, scaleless skin from the mid-thigh to the feet and a skin flap connected the upper thigh to the torso. This latter structure is similar to that found in modern birds, including ostriches, but was positioned higher at the knee in Ornithomimus than in birds. Ornithomimus was more like an ostrich mimic than once thought. Chilisaurus, a strange and confusing new Jurassic theropod, came to light this year as well. It was one of the few herbivorous theropods out there and looked more like a small proceropod than a relative of any theropod. Having teeth designed for chewing plant matter over meat, Chilisaurus is definitely one of the most interesting and unusual theropods out there. But unfortunately, this guy was overshadowed by a much more interesting and unusual theropod that was discovered just a few days after Chilisaurus was discovered in, and unfortunately it took all the spotlight. Yi Chi, yes, who could forget the real dragon? Just two days after the discovery of Chilisaurus, the myths of dragons became reality with the discovery of the first non-avian theropod capable of flight, not by wings, made of feathers, but bat-like wing membranes connected its elongated finger and wrist bone. Yichi was a feathered gliner and a member of the long-fingered theropods, the Scansoriopterids. Yichi is undoubtedly the most iconic and memorable paleontological discovery of 2015. Yichi was a complete surprise in the paleontology community. Lastly, let us conclude the dinosaur discoveries of 2015 with the amazing Dakota Raptor, which was announced not too long ago. Dakota Raptor was a very, very newly described member of the Dromaeosaurs and was about as tall as a man and about the size of the equally famous Utah Raptor. Unlike Utah Raptor though, Dakota Raptor was thinner and more leanly built as opposed to the bulkiness of Utah Raptor. Dakota Raptor was clearly built for speed and swiftness. It lived in Hell Creek alongside the famous T-Rex and Triceratops. It was undoubtedly covered in feathers and possessed wings. Dakota Raptor, like Yuchi, is one of the most memorable dinosaur discoveries in the year and has become an icon in the paleontology community. And that's about it as far as dinosaur discoveries go. It was a successful year for the dinos, but it was equally successful for the non-dinosaur extinct organisms as well. And I might as well talk about the other non-dinosaur discoveries of this year too. Probs the most notable, Hallucinogena got ahead. The truly bizarre and primitive creature from a time of oddities, aka the Cambrian, was extremely difficult to reconstruct with a hard to identify head and tail end. It was finally given a proper head. The multi-limbed, multi-spined animal was discovered to have a head with simple eyes, teeth, and manipulative tentacles. Papacellus was another notable discovery. This strange turtle relative is probably the closest thing to a missing link we can get. Papacellus was a semi-aquatic reptile and gives us an idea of how ribs became fused and evolved into protective shells in modern turtles and tortoises. Yet another missing link is the very interesting four-legged serpent, Tetrapodophius. Tetrapodophius was an ancient relative to modern snakes and shows us that snakes once had four vestigial limbs before losing them entirely, clearly showing their ancestry from four-limbed lizards. 
Tetrapod of Fios was a constrictor that preyed on small animals during the early Cretaceous. Tetra is an extremely important discovery in the research of the evolution of snakes. Bunostegus was basically a large Permian cow with skin-covered horns like that on the heads of modern giraffes, and were part of an extinct group called the Parareptiles. New research suggests it was one of the first truly upright walking animals. Unlike the sprawling posture of most animals during its time period, Bunostegus had special adaptations in its humerus, shoulder, and joints that made a sprawling lizard posture impossible, making it probably one of the first upright walkers in the world of sprawlers, long before dinosaurs and even mammals. The seas were once swam by giants. The giant filter-feeding shrimp-like Igorocasus was discovered this year, a 6.6-foot-long anomalo acrid that swam the ocean seas of the Ordovician. It was a distant relative to the famous predatory Anomalocaris, and was the whale shark of its day. A new Canadian species of Dimetrodon was properly named this year as Dimetrodon borealis, centuries after its original discovery. Arvinaceles was discovered this year as well, and was a small turtle that possessed nasal passages unlike any other turtle, giving it a vaguely pig-like appearance. It's one of the weirdest turtles that lived, and lived alongside famous dinos like Parasaurolophus. Another strange animal discovered this year with a strange nasal passage was Musicosaurus, a strange new ichthyosaur which had four nasal openings, as opposed to most other animals too. However, these probably were not visible in the living animal. The new Carolina Butcher, or Carnufex, was a predatory crocodiliomorph, which was about 10 feet long, 5 feet tall, and walked on its hind limbs. It was a relative of crocodilians and postosuchus, and was terrifying, and thankfully lived only during the late Triassic. I've already talked about the very awesome three-horned giraffe relative named after Star Wars, the Xenocurix, so I don't think I need to say more. Phosphosaurus was a completely unexpected new mosasaur that lived 72 million years ago in Japan, during the late Cretaceous. Phosphorosaurus was 10 feet long, small at least compared to most mosasaurs. But the interesting thing about this animal was its skull and eyes. Paleontologists determined that this mosasaur had binocular vision, meaning its eyes were on the front of the face and could see the same image at the same time, like humans and T-Rex, providing depth perception. This suggests Phosphorosaurus was a deep water or nocturnal hunter, preying on animals such as squid and bioluminescent fish, similar to the modern lanternfish. Phosphorosaurus used its specialized vision to prey in dark waters. It swam in seas only lit by bioluminescence, with eyes able to see in the dimly lit water. Studies also indicate that the animal was most likely an ambush predator that would lie in wait for prey, as it was not as efficient as a swimmer as larger mosasaurs. It was probably one of the more unique mosasaurs and was probably like a goblin shark. Let me talk about Dimetrodon, because I made a pretty big mistake in my Dimetrodon video. I said the discovery of the half sail was made in 2015. That is incorrect. The Dimetrodon specimen has been known for a really, really long time. The taxon from which the half sail was proposed has been known since 1907. The half sail proposal itself was made in 2012, not 2015. I came across this dirt while doing my research, but stupid me just assumed it was a typo. So I just wanted to apologize for that mistake. But the half-seal reconstructions are still a go, and not inaccurate or disproven at the time of this video's creation. Alright, moving on. A recently discovered and fossilized poop, yes poop, might actually give evidence of hair or primitive hair-like structures in therapocytes during the late Permian. Yes, we might finally have evidence of hairy gorgonopsids and other Permian synapsids. If this discovery is true, this is by far the oldest evidence of this mammalian character in the stem group of mammals and hair or hair-like structures must be a more ancient trait to synapses than once thought. And lastly, who could forget our own cousin, Homo nailidae? Yes, another human, not Homo sapien, but one of our close cousins, along with Neanderthal and Florensis. In South Africa, fossils of at least 15 individuals have been discovered in the cave. The current dating on the fossils is yet to be determined, and debates have varied between 3 million years old and less than 1 million years old. It is crazy to think that humans, Homo sapiens, weren't the only upright walking primates to dwell the Earth, not too recently, and our ancestors shared their environment with the rivals. Nelidi probably wouldn't look too much different than a human, and one would maybe mistake Nelidi for a human. Crazy, right? Well, that's all for Paleontology 2015, and it was a very successful year. Nocturnal mosasaurs, dragons, Permian bears, and four-legged snakes. What a year. But the bigger question is, what's up for next year? Well, let me segue into my next section and give my predictions for Paleontology 2016. And next year, we'll have to find out if I got anything right. Okay, well, here are my predictions. My first prediction is that we will find a sauropod or prosauropod with evidence of feathers or protofeathers of some kind. We've known since 2014 that feathers were an ancestral trait to all dinosaurs, and it would be interesting to finally see if feathers were in sauropods at all. 
They weren't theropods and orniskians, so why not sauropods and prosauropods? Mohawk plateosaurs sounds pretty cool to me. Next, hopefully we'll find conclusive evidence that T. rex did indeed have feathers. We found basically evidence to support everything about T. rex being feathered, and a video is planned to discuss all the evidence. But I think the paleontology community is just waiting for the inevitable. Maybe a T-Rex will be just as well preserved as Ornithomimus this year, and we will finally have conclusive proof and not just phylogenetics. Or maybe someone will finally publish pre-existing evidence that T-Rex had feathers. I'm talking to you, Paul Serrano. You've discussed multiple times that you have skin of a T-Rex in your office that supports feathers, so publish it already. Anyways, next, I think we'll finally find conclusive evidence of fur during the Permian period and that Permian synapsids had fur themselves. We've already seen a little bit of this this year, with that fossilized poop with possibly fur within it, so why not? I say we'll find evidence of feathers in a non silurosaurian theropod, maybe like an allosaur, a megalosaur, or a spinosaur, or something of that kind. And maybe evidence of feathers in another Orniscian dinosaur. We've already found three dinosaurs with direct evidence of feathers this year alone, so why not? Maybe 2016 will be the year of the feathers. Alright, next, maybe a fully carnivorous Orniscian. Heck, we found plant-eating theropods with Chilisaurus and Therizinosaurus. Maybe we'll have a fully carnivorous Hadrosaur. The Carboniferous hasn't had much attention in recent years, so it would be interesting to see if anything comes out of it this year. And for my last prediction, we will finally find a primitive pterosaur ancestor. We are still lacking on a definitive common ancestor to all pterosaurs, and unlike dinosaur evolution, not much is known about pterosaur evolution, at least in fossil discoveries. It would be interesting if we find the common ancestor, or something like it, to all pterosaurs and a transition species between them as flightless filament-covered archosaurs to flying air sac toting airships. Well, those are all my predictions for Paleontology 2016, and future self, please tell me if I got anything right. Alright, in this section I'm just going to give you guys the rundown of what's going to be planned for 2016 on my channel. First, I'm finally going to get that blasted Mothman Flatwoods Monster video done. I've been doing a lot of research and the day has been pushed back back and back and then hopefully next week I can get it to you guys. Next, I will hopefully and finally finish my 100,000 subscriber special, which is a video discussing all the information behind T-Rex and its integumen. Or in other words, a video discussing everything about T-Rex's skin covering, feathers, scales, bare skin, the whole shindig. I've actually been discussing a lot of the information in this video with the always helpful and super awesome Nick Turinetti and Tom Parker from the Saurian Project. Just a truly amazing video game centered around the Hell Creek Formation and presenting accurate dinosaur depictions. The two of them are giving me access to unpublished documents and discoveries which I will be able to give you guys. So thank you Nick and Tom. And I think you, the viewer, will actually be surprised about the truth about T-Rex and I'll clear up a lot of the misconceptions and myths about T-Rex as well. I think it will just be an all around mind blowing and hopefully very educational video for all my fans. I also plan to do a lot of paleo profiles next year, such as Dunkleosteus, Andrew Sarkis, Megalania, Triceratops, Diplodocus, Tanistrophius, and many, many others. So stay tuned, you paleontology fans. I also plan to make videos on dinosaur sounds, what if an event never happened, such as the KPG mass extinction, the effects of a nuclear war, prehistoric and future civilizations, and lots, lots more. I also plan to finally release my KPG mass extinction, how it went down video. I've been working with the always amazing Brian Ng, a paleontologist rapper, yes, a paleontologist backer to help me with accuracy, and I also hope to do a Saurian presentation video as Nick has suggested giving me access to an early version of Saurian to show you guys. I just hope I can work together with those guys from Saurian. Shout up to you guys, you guys are amazing. And finally, maybe, just maybe, I can review the Walking With series if YouTube fixes its copyright stuff so I won't get destroyed for using fair use and just following the law. So, really stay tuned for this year, because it's going to be a crazy year. 2015 has been especially amazing, and I want to thank a few people. Personally, I want to thank Nick or Tropoteryx for supplying me with his amazing drawings. Dude, you are awesome. I want to also thank Civilized Elk and Scott Porter for giving me support, and I want to thank all you artists that give me your fan art. And finally, I want to thank all you guys, my viewers and subscribers who have helped me grow this channel and myself this year. Thank you. I'm so happy I can educate so many people on my passion, and all you guys are so awesome. Well, anyways, as always, thanks for watching. Happy New Year. See you all in 2016.